Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is Environmental Sciences video 18. It's on land use. You're probably familiar with this skyline. It's the Las Vegas Strip, but it's actually a small portion of the Las Vegas area. This picture was taken in 1984, and now I'm going to show you a picture taken in the same location in 2011. And watch what's happened to Las Vegas. So we've had huge development into the periphery. We call that urban sprawl, and it brings with it some ecosystem impacts. And so land development will always occur with humans, but we're seeing a movement from the rural to the urban, into the cities. We call that urbanization. That's actually a good thing. It can leave more land, conserve for ecosystem services. The problem is not only are we seeing growing cities, but we're seeing growing transportation. We're getting highways, the arrival of the car, and that leads to urban sprawl. The cities are spreading out and we lose all the benefits of the city. Also as people move out they take their tax base with them and that can lead to urban blight on the inside of the city. And so we're getting these ecosystem impacts. With urban sprawl we're eating up the land around the city so there's a loss of land and also we have pollution. So we can have air pollution, we can have light and noise pollution and heat pollution. We see that in the urban heat islands. But we're always going to have development so people are putting forward this idea of we need growth that's smart or smart growth to to avoid some of these negative consequences. But in parallel to that, we're also trying to conserve land. And we've been doing this in all countries around the world. In the US, this is highlighted in the national parks. We have wilderness areas, wildlife refuges, and then around cities, we're trying to protect the wetlands and the forests. And so this is the movement towards the cities. In 1950, this is where people were living. 70% of the people on the planet lived in rural areas and less than 30% in the cities. Watch what happened over the last 50 years Years and what they predict into the next 50 years, those are going to flip-flop. And so we're getting this movement to the cities. This has already occurred in a lot of the uh, developed countries. And so the U.S., it's already over 75% of the people are living in the cities. But we're going to see this in developing countries. As they come online, we're going to have more people moving into the urban areas. You can see this in an age structure diagram. This is females in a rural county in Iowa. And you can see that once they go to college, the numbers drop off in that area. Now, why is that? In a rural setting with industrial agriculture, there's not jobs anymore. And so you can see that they're moving into the cities. This is the growth in a urban area of Iowa. And so we're seeing this movement into the cities due to opportunity. You can get jobs there. And once you move into the city, you're not going to move back. And so this going to transition is going to occur into the future. It's actually a good thing. If we think about low density housing, I want you to concentrate on the green area here. Let's say we have nine houses and they're all spread out. Let's say this is in a subdivision. Each of them have their own yard. Then we have to put roads to each of those. And what's happening is we're losing that valuable land. But if we get the movement into the city, so we take those same nine houses, stack them on top of each other, let's call them apartments. Now we've got higher density housing. We can have a park that they share and a, a fewer roads. And now we leave more of that land outside the city. And so cities are actually good. The problem is urban sprawl. And so if we put a city right here and then put a couple of roads to it, so back around the turn of the last century, cities started to grow. And that's because there were opportunities there. And so if we say this is the housing density, so we're going to have the greatest density inside the center of the city, there's opportunities there. It's really hard to get into the city. We don't have a lot of roads. We don't have a lot of transportation. It's hard to get out of the city. And so we're going to see these flourishing inner cities. Now what happens though around the uh, last half of the last century is that we have the arrival of roads, infrastructure, and the automobile. Now it's easier to get in and out of the city. And people started doing that. They started uh, buying up lower density housing. And so what you get is this urban sprawl, this movement away from the city. And this is a positive feedback loop. The more people move out, the more roads there are, the more tax base there is, and we're going to get more movement out. And we're going to encroach into the area around it. They're also bringing their tax base with them. And so that leaves a lot of the time urban blight areas on the inside of the city where people aren't actually living. Now, this is kind of a United States problem where it's more of a problem in the U.S. And so if we look at this graph, this is the area per person. And so these are all U.S. cities. And so in U.S. cities like Houston and Phoenix, we have low density housing. 
If we look on this side on gasoline use in the U.S., we're going to be using more gasoline. And so since cities in the U.S. formed later than those in, in Europe, and also since we were using the automobile and we had increase in highway structure, we've had the sprawl be a larger problem in the U.S. Brings with it problems in all cities. Pollution to be an example. So this is smog in Mexico City. We also get noise and light pollution and heat pollution. If we look specifically at heat pollution, we're seeing these heat islands where cities are. And so this is a picture of Manhattan. This is Central Park right here. And then we're looking at a map down on Manhattan. You can see Central Park right here. And areas that are really green are areas that are rich in vegetation. But watch what happens if I now show you heat coming off of the land, you can see that we're going to have higher temperature, hotter temperatures where we don't have that vegetation. So as we build up those cities, it's actually absorbing that heat and creating a heat island. And so how do we solve this problem? Well, one thing would be to plant a lot of trees, but how do we return people to the city center? A lot of people are going around this idea of smart growth. And so we need to create desirable locations in the downtown, walkable neighborhoods, compact building design, sense of place in the city, growth boundaries perhaps around the city, so we force people to stay within those settings. Now there are pros and cons of all of these, but sprawl is definitely having some negative impacts. Now outside the cities, we've also been trying to preserve land. So the National Park Service was instituted and we have national parks like Yosemite and Yellowstone National Park. We try to protect this area for people into the future. Now if you've ever been into a park, we still have roads there, we still have infrastructure um, run by the National Park Service. We also have of wildlife refuges. So those are administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So this is ANWR. This is in Alaska. It's a national wildlife refuge. These are set up to protect specific species. In this case, it's the caribou. And then the strictest of constraints are in the wilderness areas, which are administered by all four of these entities. Inside a wilderness area, we try to limit roads. The only way you can really get in is walking, riding a horse, or by canoe. And so we don't have mining inside those wilderness areas. And so we're trying to protect these areas so they're not developed into the future. And we're also on a micro scale trying to protect wetlands around cities. This is a forest that's been protected in Poland since the 1300s. So if we put boundaries around that, we can number one, mitigate it so we don't have development into these valuable areas. We can restore them when they're damaged or remediate them. All of these are very big, big things that we can do around cities. And so did you learn the following? Could you pause the videos to this point and fill in the blanks? Remember, development and urbanization can cause urban sprawl. That pollution could be air pollution, light pollution, and heat pollution. Um, we're trying to conserve our planet, preserving it in national parks, wilderness areas, wildlife refuges, and wetland areas. But the biggest thing is we have to be smart in the growth. We're always going to have development, but we have to make that smart development, and I hope that was helpful.